Hello again. Um, before we start, let's uh, set our motivation. So, as ever, uh, aspiring towards or trying to uh, um, uh, develop our training in the path of the Bodhisattva, the, the being whose mind is set on Buddhahood, um, in order to benefit all beings. Um, we're looking to use whatever we learn, including including now, towards helping us in our path, uh, based in compassion, altruism, and uh, uh, the wish to develop a uh, further insight. Um, so, with that in mind, let's do what we can to consider, uh, to listen intently, and to work on. Um, being informed by or allowing ourselves to be informed by what it is that we engage in, uh, both in this session, but also from all other sources as well. Okay, so uh, today, last week we covered, uh, we sort of finished off um, joyous effort or uh, joyous perseverance, uh, uh, which is the fourth of the um, six perfections. And this week, what we're doing is uh, Jay Rinpoche has um, combined both a meditative uh, stabilization, or also known as concentration or samatha in uh, Sanskrit, or a shine in Tibetan. So this uh, idea of a stabilized mind or a flexible mind, and also which is the fifth of the uh, six perfections. And then the sixth, which is uh, wisdom or insight. So these, this two, uh, unyana in, in in Sanskrit. So uh, of these, uh, Jerimbache is going to be d dedicating the entire third volume to these two. So he wants to provide them in a shorter form uh, in uh, in the context of the six perfections. And so what he's done is he's produced a single chapter that covers them briefly. So um, he starts off talking about uh, the fifth per perfection, um, which he has translated as uh, meditative stabilization. Um, but um, I find that quite a mouthful, but I'll try my best. Um, or alternative shine or samadha um, is also what is known. So he says, first of all, it's basically there are five parts to the training in, in developing uh, samadha, uh, what it is, what it, what this is. Um, how to begin to develop it, um, how, the divisions of it, what it what it looks like, um, how to practice it, and then a summary. So this sort of structure is again found throughout Lamrim Chema, and he hasn't deviated too strongly from it here either. So in brief, he he starts off saying, well, what is it? Well, what is uh, what do we mean when we talk about uh, samatha or, or meditative stabilization? And uh, he says that it's marked by these particular qualities. One of them is that it's virtuous. It's one-pointed. It's a single-pointed state of mind. It's a state of mind that remains fixed on the object of meditation. Okay, so the object of meditation is not necessarily a visualization. It's not necessarily a thing. It's not necessarily something. It's just the ability to to stay on task, to remain on task, and to remain with this sort of uh, um, stable, uh, uh, stable mind that's able to to continue on that journey um, without distraction. Right. So, uh, um, Jerem Bache cites uh, a sangha here. Um, it's this one pointed state of mind stabilized in the virtue and um, either of the nature of the mundane or supramundane, which here means whether or not we've uh, um, achieved instead of um, uh, enlightenment or a lower version of enlightenment, um, of the bodhisattvas who've studied and reflected on the, the collections. So whether it's oriented towards serenity itself, towards this uh, um, just remaining serene, or this stability itself, towards insight, or towards uh, both as a path that joins them together, understand that this single-pointed state of mind is known as stabilization. So here there's an important point being made by Asanga, which is that um, 
that there is the idea of serenity or of just sort of a peaceful a uh, very, very peaceful, relaxed state of mind, which remains focused, uh, um, but um, is um, very, very flexible, very, very gentle. There is also that mind trained upon insight, vipassana or, or, or jnana, is wisdom, is understanding. And then likewise, um, uh, there's the mind that actually joins this calmness, this serenity and insight uh, together. So earlier on in the very first, in about last year, we were discussing the structure of meditation, what meditation is, and meditation is divided into this analytic um, and into this uh, concentration meditation. So analytic is where we actually just think about, re remain on task, remain considering. So for instance, thinking about karma, uh, we, we examine all the different details of karma until we understand it clearly, and, and, we, and it begins to inform our lives. So what we're trying to do is familiar, familiarize ourselves with it until it becomes a part of our reality. So we begin to recognize it, understand how it works, and so on. And then we begin to uh, it becomes we begin to accommodate it within our lives, and therefore it informs us. So this is a very very important aspect of meditation is this analytical meditation. Uh, some practitioners don't really even consider it to, to be meditation, except that it is in terms of the fact that we're using our minds to to, to set to stay on task to think about and to and to imagine to, and to examine critically examine all the different aspects of a particular object of meditation karma or loving kindness so with loving kindness for instance also there's a sense of w working on the analytical aspect of loving kindness where we're developing um, a, a sense of a feeling uh, reasons for why we should or could develop a, a kindness towards all, all sentient beings um, and then what we do is we work on that creative, using creative imagination, but also um, uh, uh, scripture or our own insights or our own ideas in to develop that to a greater and greater degree. So we're expanding our and, and developing and entrenching our minds and filling our minds with this loving kindness. And when, during that phase, we actually have this sense of fill, fill, filling up with, with loving kindness towards all beings, then at that point we can relax, we can just sustain that, s remain focused on that, develop the feeling of that, and allow ourselves to be infused by it, like a tea, I guess, right? So infused all the way through with loving kindness, and then as that begins to fade, because we, uh, uh, because of depending upon the strength of our meditation, um, what we then do is we go back into analytical, or alternative, we, we strengthen it anyway, go back into analytical to further develop that strength until it becomes more and more infused. And similarly, it begins to inform our life. It begins to change our perception, change the way in which our attitudes and our perceptions in our life. And in this sense, we begin to realize it. When we realize it, what that means is it is real for us. That it doesn't mean anything else. No flashes of lightning, nothing like this. It's just suddenly we understand, uh, we understand that this is the way things are. So one of the aspects of this, or this is how we feel, you know, there's a natural, naturally arising feeling. So one of the aspects of this very much is to say that to try and work on the idea of, um, for instance, death awareness, is when we are actually become more and more aware of death, it can, if we're not careful about how we do it, we can become quite sad. So we need to be careful to also counteract that with the idea of thinking about how wonderful it is to be alive, you know, what, what wonderful opportunities we have, what's known as the, the precious human birth. So these sorts of things are really important for us to use uh, to help develop a sense of uh, importance and immediacy in our practice, uh, to help us in our, in our journey, our spiritual journey, especially with the development of bodhicitta. So the two types of bodhicitta I talked about earlier on is this uh, compassionate, altruistic bodhicitta, which is our responsibility for all beings, and likewise the ultimate bodhicitta, which is our understanding of the way things are through our comprehensive understanding of the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Interdependent Links, which provides us with an, an idea about how we are bound and remain bound within, within samsara. So within that, um, what we're looking at specifically here is the stabilization, the concentration meditation, but in fact, in terms of the perfection of meditation, uh, what the Sangha suggests is that this also includes um, uh, insight in terms of an analytical approach as well. 
so it, it says um although most of this is based on 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 serenity developing a serene mind rather than a, or a single uh, gentle uh, uh, mind that's able to remain sustained on the same object indefinitely so without without too much uh, conceptual going on in this case so of this um uh, Jerem Pish says it says that it's a good idea for us in in order to to, be, to begin cultivation of this mind is to consider the benefits of of um, samatha and the faults of of not cultivating it and this again he he says um, in this particular case I will talk about this in depth in the following volume so um, right now we just have to wait uh, but. Uh, clearly, there are many, many benefits from being able to remain focused and to remain on task rather than be distracted by or deviate from something where we could just end up going all over the place. So, uh, uh, one of the um, one of the ways in which we have a, a um, traditional um, uh, methods or uh, metaphors for this is the idea of the elephant mind and the monkey mind. And the elephant mind is just plunders on on its on its direction is impossible to change so sometimes this is like when we um are fixated on something that's upset us and we just find it very hard to deviate from the path it's not what we want to do but we just can't even get it to move to move back towards practice right which is like uh, uh, uh. so this is our elephant mind and the monkey mind is like oh this oh that oh this oh that so jumping all over the place so these two sorts of minds like this we're trying to train and tame them uh, so that that we can actually uh, uh, do what we need to do. So it's a beautiful, um, well, well-known uh, 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 alternative metaphor with the ox herder. So uh, uh, the ox going all over the place and then gradually um, becoming useful. So this idea of the, the, the benefits and the drawbacks of the benefits of developing this stable mind, this um, serenity, and the drawbacks of, of not is that basically we have no control over our minds in this sense. A huge number of benefits to being able to keep our focus uh, it helps with our work all sorts of different types of work it helps with us um, it's very very difficult to talk to somebody who's jumping all over the place so uh, it's also very difficult to talk uh, meaningfully if we're jumping all over the place so in terms of the divisions um, uh, which is the, the third section in this case um, Jerem Pichet says that we can do this in uh, different ways according to the nature. If we look at the nature, there are two divisions: that into that, that which is mundane, a normal worldly meditation, uh, uh, serenity, or also the super mundane, that of a of a, um, uh, a um, bodhisattva who's had a direct insight into emptiness. Then this is like on the path of insight or concentration. Then this is a super or oh, Buddha. Then there's a super mundane. Mm, concentration and then he says there are three kinds that's which are oriented towards this serenity calm is or oriented towards insight or both conjoined and then he says there's three another way of doing this according to function there are three types here now these three are sort of in a sense uh, um, such that you have a broad scope, a narrow scope, and a more narrow scope, uh, and so uh, the the, mo the most narrow scope includes the broader scope. So, in the broadest scope, is the idea that it stabilizes the body and the mind in this state of bliss, uh, uh, physical um, and mental comfort within this life. So, a lot of this aspect is often found in in normal uh, commercial. Um, uh, training for mind training if we're doing this sort of thing uh, then uh, a lot of this is to do with you know feel good feel relaxed all the benefits of this rather than anything more so this is the broadest approach that we find the use of of uh, this practice being used mm. the second one is um uh, all the stabilizations or the meditative states that uh, generate this pliancy um so that's the first one, this pliancy, when we enter correctly, when we develop this really powerfully, there's a natural bliss that arises. The second one is uh, one that is used to 
uh, accomplish all good qualities. And what this means is it's a, a part of the path shared by all of the different practitioners of the Buddhist path. So uh, Srabhaka, um, Pratyeka and Bodhisattva Buddhas all uh, require uh, this um, meditative serenity. It's part of the three higher trainings, yeah? Sila, Samatha, uh, uh, um, Jnana. Right? So Samatha here is this meditative equipoise, this, this serenity. The serene mind is absolutely relevant. This powerfully able mind uh, uh, is, is required in order for us to achieve enlightenment, regardless of whether we're bodhisattva or non-bodhisattva. And then lastly, the third, uh, so all liberations, all mastery, uh, in terms of Buddhist mastery, a liberation from samsara depends upon uh, this type of, uh, of, of meditation. Now the quality of meditation is very similar to the first, it's just the, the purpose is changed, the focus, the reason why. And lastly, the, stabil the, the stabilization that um, carries out the welfare of all living beings, that of the Bodhisattva. So when we are engaging in, in meditation or we're engaging in any, any positive virtuous activity by making sure that our mind is set for doing this for the purpose of benefiting all beings, then we're able to help it become a, 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 a Bodhisattva activity. So when we're thinking, okay, through this may I become a Buddha and therefore benefit all beings, um, this this then is a bodhisattva activity and likewise it, it means that when we're doing this meditation it's achieving our ability to become a buddha and therefore it benefits all sentient beings in, it, in its nature so how do we practice this this is very brief most of the time we get how to practice is the, is the last paragraph of the chapter and here he says basically um, we use these six supremacies and all six perfections. So six supremacies are all about us sustaining and remembering and recollecting our responsibility to all beings, uh, our sense of doing this in order to achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. So this mind, this bodhicitta mind, uh, provides us with the basis, substantial basis of turning our actions into those which are supreme. And likewise, they are then flavoured by each of the six perfections are flavoured by all of the others. So when we're doing this, we're thinking about, let's say, for instance, in generosity, the generosity of, of, of this sort of practice is being able to achieve this in order that we may be able to bring that in others. Yeah, But also because it's a generosity in terms of our practice, our practice of doing this for the benefit of all beings uh, is our um, is our time and our energy spent uh, in order to be able to achieve or to benefit directly and indirectly all beings anyway. So there's also the benefit in terms of our to our teacher. This is just in terms of generosity. I'm just giving this as an example. So uh, the best way in which to uh, uh, repay the kindness of a teacher in terms of the, the Dharma is by doing the practice. And it's also true with everything though, in the sense, if you think about it, if you have a good, if you have a piano teacher, they are going to be so much more fulfilled by you demonstrating your um, perseverance and your, uh, and the practice that you're putting into piano. Of course, it, you know, they may be commercial, they might need you to pay them, but it's um, seeing, them, seeing you actually doing the work is what will bring them happiness. So this is also true in Buddhist, you know, Buddhism, where there's no money involved. The whole purpose of this is that Dharma is beyond value. But in terms of thinking what I want, you know, being able to offer uh, uh, practice is the highest gift I can offer my teachers. So then, uh, in summary, uh, Jerome Pichet says that um, it's the basis of the spirit of enlightenment, all right, uh, which is the basis of all the bodhisattva deeds. So, the spirit of enlightenment, this this uh, sense of um, um, in, uh, universal responsibility for all beings, um, that this mind itself, which is then recognizes that Buddhahood is the best ability to to meet those needs, um, is it this in, this is then inspires us to practice the six perfections and within that is to develop this uncontaminated 
uh, uh, um, stabilization, mental stabilization. So then when we've been able to stabilize this spirit, this, this um, intention, this mind, a um, uh, uh, spirit of enlightenment, not uh, sort of this, this uh, sense of, um, of working for all beings, um, then we continue to develop um, our meditative stabilization, our, our mental stabilization. And he says, even if we're unable to do this, so some of us find it very, very hard to meditate. Some of us are far, are far more uh, uh, able at other things rather than to, to meditate deeply. He says, even if we're not able to do this, we should strive to train from time to time. This because this sets good patterns. It sets, sets good patterns in our, in, into our future, but also it'll help to break some of the, the major blocks we have with our practice. So by developing the ability to meditate and sustain our mind in single-pointed concentration, this really helps us to let go of distracted uh, thought and also helps to train us away from being in stuck patterns, sort of stuck records, this sort of thing. And it says even if you if you have if you have um, uh, uh, little ability, even if you are able to try to keep this going uh, uh, throughout your life, even still, even if you are not able to get very far, your mind will improve regardless. So it's uh, one of the qualities about stabilizing meditation is that however small amount of training you do, do it still has a significant effect. And then in future lives, um, he says, according to the questions of Subhu Sutra, um, then this will uh, arise much more easily and be much more easy for you to uh, achieve the stabilization. So, and that's all that Jerembeshe has to say about meditative um, stabilization or, or shamata until the next book. But um, uh, one of the aspects, I think, of more than probably any other aspect of of uh, Buddhist practice is um, that meditation is mind training, the ability for us to, to develop this flexible focused mind um, is a bit like, it's not particularly uh, um, fun and sometimes it feels a little bit, uh, it can feel a little bit of a chore I mean, in terms of the fact that uh, we're just working on sustaining our concentration the whole way through. Um, but in many, many ways, I, I think it, it reminds me of gym. So, you know, we go to a gym to get fit, keep fit and so on. And yet, uh, especially in the West, there seems to be nothing similar to that for our minds. We sort of like, yeah, my, you know, my body is my temple. But what about me? I mean, where is this mind? It's just wandering around sort of all over the place in this temple, sort of, uh, you know, like a, an elephant sometimes running into pillars in, in this temple. Um, maybe peeing in the corner and so on, and the monkey jumping from chandelier to chandelier. And it's like, well, maybe it would be a good idea to try to bring them together and contain them too. And so we have this sort of uh, thing of saying, even if we have no spiritual aspiration whatsoever, being able to uh, work with and do workouts, mind workouts, in a way which is able to settle our mind is fantastic. It's really, really beneficial for us. So none of these things are necessarily uh, strange in the end. It's just the ability to uh, uh, work with and to sustain some sort of ability to bring our mind into focus, to sustain that focus um, uh, in order to complete things, but also bring, up, bring our minds away from fixations, for instance. It's very, very useful indeed. So I think... Um, when I was younger, I think uh, uh, monkey mind was the main issue. You know, everything was jumping around all the time. And then later on, it was sort of much more elephant mind. <laughs> I thought a monkey mind was difficult. And then it's like no elephant minds are much harder to deal with because these fixations can be very, very governing, very powerful, and can be very destructive as well. A monkey mind is just flitty. It's sort of not very destructive. It just doesn't go very far. But uh, elephant mind is, can be very, very destructive indeed. 
So then uh, Jerem Shea carries on to talk a little bit about the perfection of wisdom. So this is again uh, uh, just a, a quick uh, cover, a quick touch on this. Um, and again he divides this into what, what wisdom is, uh, how to begin in the generation and then developing it, um, the divisions of wisdom, and how to practice it, and then a summary, just the same again. So there's a sort of this Lamrim formula being used. So wisdom uh, vipassana, or is the, one of the Sanskrit or Pali words for it, and also jnana, wisdom, and likewise um, hlatong, insight, uh, is Tibetan. So all of these are just translations for the same meaning here. And one of the aspects, generally, especially within the Mahayana tradition of wisdom, is when we really understand the nature of existence of whatever we're looking at, the, the nature of, of its existence. So this primarily is a sort of um, uh, recognizing the truth, uh, the, the, the final truth uh, of the nature of, of anything that comes to mind, uh, or, or, or that is brought to mind in that sense. Um, but also, this is just in general what you know, insight means, but in terms of the perfection of wisdom, this is just one aspect of that. And in fact, uh, generally in the, in, the, in the perfection of wisdom, um, Asanga points out that the five topics of knowledge are also um, uh, relevant. So, uh, Asanga says, uh, know that the Bodhisattva's wisdom is the thorough analysis of, of all things um, that is to be known. Uh, and then, uh, so this is primarily this understanding the nature of reality, and then also through focusing on the five topics of knowledge. So five topics of knowledge are, are probably better to understand at a semantic level in terms of um, what they meant rather than the translation. So that the the, the one of them is science, which is uh, generally understood as to mean within a Buddhist context, but it's actually to, using the same sorts of techniques that we have in modern science, such as scientific method, where we we examine and examine again. We don't just accept. We really look clearly and we understand it, like a saying, gold or or, or anything else. We really, really check carefully, make hypothesis, test the hypothesis, experiment again. So this sort of idea is very, very um, relevant to our understanding. Secondly, uh, uh, the uh, original word was grammar, but essentially what this is talking about is um, language, uh, comprehension, understanding, and being able to express clearly. So these two things are absolutely relevant. So it's not just grammar, although the, this is the traditional translation given, it's the ability to understand and to speak or to write uh, in a very clear way, which is um, a, a clear and resonant way. So a lot of this is not just tied to a single language, but also to languages in general. That would be included within this aspect. So we have science, we have language, we have logic. Now logic is the translation word, but uh, in many ways this would be best expressed as mathematics. So mathematics is sort of using problem solving uh, uh, with, whereas within the Indian tradition generally, and um, it's actually very advantageous in many ways, uh, uh, mathematics is, uh, uh, um, are initially taught through understanding logic. Whereas in the West, understanding is generally taught through arithmetic, through adding and subtracting. So um, in terms of focus, the focus is less on number and more on uh, logic and, and being able to actually begin to use the tools that are available within mathematics in a, in a broader sense. Um, and then uh, uh, the arts. So this arts they, uh, include um, everything that we normally would call the arts, such as uh, um, uh, painting and and uh, uh, drawing and sculpture and architecture uh, and construction, but also weaving, um, uh, acting, uh, poetry, all of these different things here. So the crafts, all the crafts and the arts together are put together um, uh, into this large group called the arts. 
um, and then also medicine. So these are the five bases. So medicine um, primarily is not just about what pills to take, but it's also to do with mental, so ther therapy in many ways. Probably a better translation again would be therapy rather than just the idea of, you know, what pills or what herbs to take. So it's much more about thinking of, of a larger scope of, of activity to do with health and health care mental and physical health care. So these five really, science, language, mathematics, um, art, and, uh, and, um, and medicine or therapy. So all of these, again, are a part of, a, 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 a developed through training, right? So a part of this is that we can learn, we learn from experts, we learn from people who are masters of these traditions, and where is the line, where do we draw the line? Well, um, we, we are going to find it very unlikely to be able to learn all of everything, um, and we'll find it much harder to be skillful or masters of everything. And the point about all of this, I think, which uh, Rimshe will mention shortly, is that we do that within the same uh, bounds of motivation that we do any other type of practice. So we do it with virtue in mind, with uh, working towards Buddhahood in mind, to, to uh, that, that which will help us be informed about how to act or what to do, um, so that which informs us and that which informs others. So within the path, uh, taking the path into the arts, into our language, into our jobs, uh, into our understanding of science, and likewise the understanding of science into our practice. So this aspect of um, uh, uh, recognizing how training and developing our skills in these areas actually has these huge interdisciplinary benefits um, across, uh, especially within our development. So right at the basis of this, if you like, right at the key aspect of, of wisdom, of the, of the uh, perfection of wisdom, um, even within the scope of understanding the nature of reality is this love of learning a, a really pure strong love uh, and um, joy of learning so this perfection of of joyous effort but uh, towards learning and 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 being able to learn meaningfully yeah not just randomly just not not just memorizing things which are not very useful, things that which are particularly useful and beneficial in our path, um, using them to develop our path, but also to be able to express the path. So all of these things are very useful to us. So how do we begin the generation of wisdom is to contemplate again the benefits of, of doing it, of generating it, and the faults of not generating it. And he says, now in the following volume, he'll be talking very, very in huge amounts of depth specifically on the wisdom of reality, of the nature of reality, uh, selflessness or emptiness. Um, but he, so he says, I'm not going to do that in this particular chapter. Instead, I'll leave that to the, the next book. But regarding uh, the, the idea of uh, learning, uh, uh, in, in terms of developing our understanding, our skill, and, our, and mastering. This uh, aspect, this nature and this ability um, is very, very easy and apparent for us to see as being beneficial. Um, in our society, especially now, um, learning uh, is generally commensurate with being paid well. So uh, it provides us with opportunities in our careers, it makes our life much more comfortable, it makes us uh, considered to, to have been using our life properly and so on. So in this sense, uh, wisdom in the, in the general sense is very, very useful. Uh, so developing this love of learning and this, in this interest in, in discovering things that are, are useful to us is very, very valuable. On the other hand, also, um, it, it's this insight, this nature of insight, and the benefit of this, which is frees us from samsara itself. So the insight, this is this, and understanding the nature of reality is what frees us. And likewise, uh, uh, Rinpoche says here that um, 
if we think about it in terms of the other five perfections, uh, insight is uh, like an eye on 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 each of those. So he's using the um, the idea of the arts. In the arts, uh, traditionally, you paint the Buddhas, um, and then before you sell them, you, you you'd sell them, or the sponsor would look at them and say, yes, that's good enough, and then you'd paint in the eyes. So the eyes is like the final detail that makes or brings to life the these uh, paintings of Buddha and so on. So in that sense, it's like it's the it's the eye of the of the it's the it's the cherry on the cake, <laughs> the, yeah, or cherry on the icing, which is what uh, is sort of uh, Jerem Pache says, and he also says it's a bit like you imagine a beautiful piece of jewelry made with gold, uh, um, and it'd be sort of jaw droppingly beautiful, and then if you had a huge cut emerald or diamond in it, then it, uh, and is done in a beautiful a beautiful way then even more, like, wow, how amazing is that? So this idea primarily is that wisdom provides this shine or this uh, quality to whatever it touches, which brings it into, into strength and power. Now, needless to say, um, within the scope of the six perfections, specifically uh, emptiness, so this uh, understanding the nature of reality, this is the ultimate bodhicitta. So all of the perfections are being used to evaluate or to help us develop as well as um, help us evaluate our understanding of the nature of reality. And likewise, understanding our nature of reality will breathe life into and uh, reinforce our understanding and our, our practice of the other five perfections. So these things are completely correlated. We have this, uh, um, if you like, this holding cup of altruistic um, bodhicitta, the responsibility to work for all sentient beings here. And then we have the covering cup here, which is our insight, is our understanding of the nature of reality. Now these two really here uh, are, are, are one. So they're like two sides of the same coin. Um, but we, uh, first of all, we, they seem to be different. Um, but in the end, we see later on, they become much more easy for us to see as being the same thing. I think I've said this before. So Jerembache says also that um, many of the other qualities that we need in terms of our practice, such as faith, depend upon wisdom. So why is this? So again, if we look at wisdom in terms of its broader sense, where the ability for us to assess clearly, to, to, to be able to exclude what's mistaken, be able to use logic, use science, use all these uh, different abilities to, to, to bring a conviction to our mind. It's much easier for us to, uh, 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 to see that an experience that we have becomes more powerful because we understand it in, 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 in its context. So when we, um, if we are, uh, have a, a very, um, a, a very able mind, then uh, like a, 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 a suffused with wisdom, then when we understand death, we begin to see all the ramifications of that, right? When we understand consequences of our actions, we, be, we, we have a much clearer understanding of the, the, the nature of that, the fact of that. So this gives us much, much stronger experiential insight into what's, what's at hand. So we can say there's less blur, there's less confusion, there's less cloudiness to it. It's far more bright and sharp for us in terms of our ability to recognize what's going on. And that gives us a far, far greater qualitative uh, uh, realization. So not only does it make it easier for us to have these realizations, but it makes them far more powerful, far more qualitatively powerful in terms of the effect they have on us. We are so much more informed by them. So this idea of having this very, very clear, uh, well-trained mind through having developed skills, uh, through having to develop this love of learning towards being able to understand, to critically analyze, to break down, to consider, to use logic, to come to conclusions, the, all of these skills work together to help us to develop uh, a clear understanding about things. And likewise, having a skill in the arts, in poetry, in language, helps us both to comprehend, but also to express 
this to others. So all of these, in a sense, are used within the scope of a bodhisattva. It's not say, I'm not saying that, you know, you'll become a bodhisattva if you learn to play guitar. What I'm saying is, is that if you are a bodhisattva, you can, by playing guitar, it can help you in your practice, right? So if we don't need to play guitar, we can do meditation and other, many other things we can do, which are just as beneficial. But we shouldn't feel that uh, we, we can find no value in these things. So whatever we do, whatever we pick up, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe um, uh, uh, archery or, or, or whatever, these can be used in our practice as a bodhisattva. So again, it's the faith. So the word faith here is important because faith really rec is recognized in a different way to the normal Western religious context. So uh, within a religious context of uh, of uh, um, uh, of um, uh, that we find in the West in, in um, non Dharma religions, so Western religions generally, um, faith means uh, 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 implies a leap, or we, there's something from which we uh, we have no evidence that we just choose to believe in. Whereas in Buddhism, faith means conviction based upon experience, on experience. You know, either direct experience or inferred experience from understanding the consequences of these things. But generally, direct experience. So there's faith is like the understanding is so, so strong that if I drop this mug, it'll fall and spill tea everywhere. So these sorts of things are like, yeah, um, I don't know if you saw it, but yeah. So if I drop the mug, then that, that will cause all sorts of problems for me. And knowing that, I have faith in that because I have of previous experiences. So this faith is is not blind. It's very, very strong, very, very clear and uh, based upon experience. So likewise, because of this, uh, um, uh, these qualities of uh, faith arise from the wisdom. Likewise, being able to see what is right or wrong in a situation, being able to understand the context of a situation, being able to assess how to best to behave in a given situation, um, what might what the consequences might be. All of these depend upon our wisdom, right? In terms of our ability, depends upon our insight, our wisdom, not just a in, in uh, wisdom into emptiness, but our wisdom, understanding of consequences, our wisdom, understanding of the nature of things, uh, uh, the nature of people, uh, uh, and so on, uh, understanding the language that's being used. All of these things help us. And Rinpoche says again that when we're looking at uh, so on this idea that we might be giving away our, our flesh or our hand for, for whatever reason, for a, a, a good reason, this is when we're very high, highly realized bodhisattvas, um, it is the wisdom that gives us the ability to do this as if it were we were just taking a cutting from a plant rather than it being um, uh, something that we will... Uh, feel so much consequences of because we understand the context so fully we're able to give more freely uh, it's not suggesting that one-handed people are necessarily more wise than anybody else right but what we're saying is that when we are able to do this without any suffering on our side without any compunction against it for the rest of our lives we'll be content with the choices that we've made and this will be out of insight so in that sense it's, it's it can be look um, we have to be careful with these because we're not going around talking about uh, committing these um, acts of uh, sacrifice like this as, as being um, a, a recommended or, or, or even supported. Uh, but what we are saying is that uh, when we have the ability, this ability will stem from insight, from our, from our wisdom.
So again, this is idea about talking about the way in which we do our practice in terms of giving. So this is really to do with the idea of giving, being able to give freely because of our wisdom. And then talking about ethical discipline is like saying it's because of our understanding of the nature of samsara, as I said earlier on. And I said when we were talking about an ethical discipline, it's because of the understanding of this that we uh, consider not just ourselves, but all beings who are trapped in this. And therefore, we think, okay, that I need to do what's best for all beings. So uh, Rinpoche is going through these, um, basically he doesn't do all of them and, and neither will I, but he what he, he does is he explains just how each of the different uh, uh, perfections is tied back to uh, this wisdom bodhicitta, a uh, wisdom, uh, um, uh, uh, ultimate bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta together, work together in each case. So he says that uh, sometimes, for instance, um, because of uh, uh, the amount of karma developed, uh, a bodhisattva might be reborn as a as a huge, um, as a sort of ruler of the world, if you like, mm. a great world leader. And in these cases, is that um, in light of their um, their altruistic intent and in light of their insight into into the nature of reality, they are, are not. Um, corrupted by the power or by the luxuries that are afforded them in this case because their understanding is looking at how to be responsible for all beings at this time. And he says even though the love of a bodhisattva is uh, uh, towards all beings is very intense, it's the insight into the nature of that which prevents there from being any attachment, any coarse attachment to all sentient beings. So again, also, he says, and this is important, he says, you know, we have this, uh, when we're practicing as bodhisattvas, we have this immeasurable joy, this wonderfully free joy um, that uh, this sort of, in, it, it sort of infuses us um, through, through this uh, feeling of uh, sense of fulfillment for doing the right thing, being, being doing everything right accordingly, understanding the process. And it's, it's wisdom, it's our insight that prevents that joy from from just becoming collapsed, just getting making us skittish, uh, going over, uh, sort of overexcited. So that um, uh, is because of our insight. Otherwise, it tends to be unstable. Joy, excessive joy, tends to be unstable. But um, if we're able to rein that in, to, to be able to actually understand it, then it's uh, it can be stabilized. So uh, Jaren Pache says that it's wisdom that provides us with the opportunity towards impartiality. So one of the aspects of this is, is Jaren Pache is talking about the conventional bodhicitta, the idea of developing this loving kindness for all beings, and he says it's underpinned by our insight into reality. But likewise, our insight into re reality is underpinned by this sense of uh, uh, love for all sentient beings, so this developing this loving kindness. So we're beginning to see how these two uh, are related, to, uh, uh, are sort of part of the same picture here. So uh, Matra Chet says, uh, in talking of Buddha, he says, you're, without rejecting the real nature, you're also in, court, in accord with the conventional. So what does that mean? Uh, essentially within uh, a discussion will um, of, it will go into in, in the in the path of insight. Uh, the 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 second half of the third volume is a division uh, into what are known as the two truths, and one of the ways in which they're described is conventional truth and ultimate truth. So conventional truth is the truth of phenomena of objects, cups and karma and ban and Buddha, all belong to conventional truths. The ultimate truth is the true nature of things, which is empty, uh, um, uh, impermanent, and so on, so uh, selfless. So these sorts of things, it doesn't mean empty like um, they're hollow. It means empty because we normally, uh, deludedly, we imagine there's something to be there which isn't there. So it's that lack of the thing that we normally would put into something um, that makes them empty. 
So there's ultimate nature there, and he says when when we actually uh, uh, have a direct insight into uh, uh, experience, direct experiential insight into the nature of reality, at first we lose focus of the object completely. Um, so uh, the the object, the subject, all of these different ideas belong to the convention. All of those drop away, and then when they drop away, um, uh, uh, when we come out of the session, we are aware of the this um this nature but we then see again these conventional objects around us so we we interact with them similarly a buddha doesn't do that a buddha has a simultaneous ability to see the nature of reality but also the conventional nature now they do that because on a, uh, from what i understand a buddha is able to see the object from the side of others so from the side of others uh, directly and then those objects arise in accordance to the to the insight uh, the, of the vision or view of others. We know that. And we're quite complicated. However, also, and this is the point uh, that uh, Jay Rinpoche has made again and again on this, is that uh, when we um, when our insight is correct, when our understanding is correct, uh, when we understand karma, uh, and when we understand uh, conventional reality clearly, then our insight into the ultimate nature of reality becomes clear. When we understand ultimate nature clearly, then our understanding of karma and and conventional nature becomes clear. So. What we're seeing is is that when if our view is not quite correct, if our understanding of emptiness is not quite correct, there's a tendency for uh, um, conventional reality, this normal phenomenal reality, um, to become vague or unfocused or unclear or wishy-washy or even appear to be a complete dream or illusion. And if that happens, then uh, um, our, 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 we have a misunderstanding um, of the nature of reality. So. This is one of the ways in which we can test to see whether or not our understanding of insight is correct. If our in, in understanding of insight is correct, then our understanding of conventional reality becomes clearer, not more obscure, not more sort of um, illusory, becomes more um, uh, more more uh, easy to see, but it becomes more uh, uh, free of uh, the taint that we cover it with. Right? We're covering everything with this smell yeah and or, or sort of muck and then and then uh, what we do is when we uh, actually understand uh, that we're able to remove that muck away yeah like that so again uh, uh jay remish points out that these texts often um uh, if we read the sutras, uh, it seems that sometimes what uh, in one sutra he says you should do this, and then the same thing in another sutra he says you shouldn't do this. So it's like unless we have insight, unless we have wisdom, it's very hard for us to recognize that actually uh, there is no contradiction. We see because what we see is apparent contradiction. So when we see apparent contradiction, then we feel like uh, it, this doesn't make any sense, or you know, Buddha's just cutting his you know, is, is going on both sides, or it's not clear, or whatever. When we understand his intent, when we understand insight, then there is no problem with that. We understand what his intent is in according to the context with it, with it, with, it, with which it is written, according to the audience for which it is written for. Then it's like, okay, now I can understand why he wrote this in this place, and why he wrote that in that place, and so on. So this is very important for us to understand. So he says, yeah, these are many, many. He says there are limitless numbers of things that um, that uh, without wisdom we will see them as being contradictory or lacking, or, or um, uh, uh, and yet if we have wisdom, then we will see them as as lacking any contradiction. And he says many things within sutras, such as the presentations of the true, the tr two truths, uh, or prescriptions again and uh, in one, and prohibitions in others, and so on, and and therefore. Um, when we recognize that wisdom um, 
provides us with the ability to distinguish between these things and recognize that they're non contradictory um then uh this is a peerless praise he said this is beyond nothing else can do this so we have to be very careful to be recognize the value of wisdom here he says in short all good qualities come from wisdom and then in terms of the lack of wisdom uh the lack of um, having wisdom and how sh how it damaging it is to our practice is essentially it's a bit like all the other perfections are blind without it they're, they're, they will struggle with them now i feel that essentially we need to be a bit careful here some people find wisdom and learning hard and, uh, and some people certainly feel that buddhism can be very intellectual and they turn away from it and actually the five perfections other than wisdom provide us with activities which are very easy to understand in terms of thinking about generosity uh, self-discipline, um, patience, tolerance, um, effort, joyous effort, and even meditation to a degree. And then it's like saying, well, within those um, uh, sort of understanding um, realities seems very hard for us to do. But in fact, as I, I said before, is we by training on this, it helps to loosen our uh, uh, obstacles to insight. So although it's true that without insight, these be, uh, are sort of like um, blind features because they don't it's very hard for us to understand how they fit together once we um, bring once we practice them and we continue to practice them actually our ability to develop wisdom and develop an understanding becomes much much sharper and much more able so although Jeremy Shea here cites lots of like a, a, a verse summary of the perfection of wisdom in 8,000 lines, which is praising wisdom and saying without it everything else is useless uh, or, or, or less useful, I should say. In, in, in many ways, in fact, what we find practically is that even if I have very little wisdom, very little um, concentration, but a, a very, very strong, generous, uh, a happy heart who uh, wishes to benefit all beings, this has a substantial effect. And as we develop it and understand um, and become more familiar with it, more experienced with dealing with the issues that arise from that, then we begin to develop this experiential natural wisdom. So it's this natural wisdom we're trying to achieve, regardless of whether or not we're clever or able. So this natural wisdom is where we begin to understand precisely the way things are from, from interaction, from paying attention. But in the end, at some point, I believe it's going to be very hard to actually close off, to finish um, our understanding of, in, uh, of uh, selflessness, of emptiness, uh, without um, some degree of uh, uh, um, willingness to start looking fundam at the fundamental truths behind, behind the facade that we see every day. So, uh, 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 for example... Um, um, there's no dispute within science, um, or in the modern world, modern science, about impermanence, subtle impermanence, the fact that everything is continually moving and changing. Okay, so um, with in order for something to be uh, completely non-moving, it would need to be um, at zero degrees Kelvin. It needs to be absolute freezing, which is impossible. So nothing is ever there. So everything is always moving very slightly, more or less, but near in a natural condition, very much so. Okay, so everything is moving that is substantial, material things moving. Empty space is an empty space, but it, everything's a moving within it. So the boundaries of space are moving. So everything that we uh, experience is impermanent, is in a continual uh, uh, state of flux of change. And in many ways, we could say that um, time is determined by uh, change, right? So in that sense, we can begin to understand from, if we examine it from a, a purely scientific, modern science base, the truth of impermanence. Yeah. So when we begin to understand the truth of impermanence, we can also see that the way in which we treat things is as if they're permanent, right? 
not as if they're impermanent. We imagine that this cup is the same cup as the one that was there yesterday. It's my cup. I've had it for a year. So it's, we're giving it, imbuing it with this permanent nature that it is about, uh, lasts from moment to moment. In fact, there's nothing there that's stable at all. It's continually changing. It's continually in motion. So the fact that everything is continually in motion means that nothing is uh, remaining the same from one moment to the next. And that includes ourselves. So uh, uh, we talk about, you know, last year I went to uh, you know, I went to India, then uh, th that would be I implying that uh, there was something now that was there then, but actually there's nothing, it's all changed. This is the nature of impermanence, right? So when we begin to see this, when we begin to, uh, be begin to understand and comprehend subtle impermanence, uh, this, this fact that everything is in a continual flux, continual change, continually uh, 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 um, um, coming into existence, if you like, from uh, the basis of the prior existence, but there's nothing really sustaining it from one moment to the next. It changes our insight here, or our ability to, to uh, see things, and it also helps us to drop some of these convictions that things shouldn't you know that we can trust these things not to change from moment to moment you know or that the, the, this um this will always be here it's mine right so these ideas and well, i'm i'm the same as i always was you know these sorts of things uh, we're we're able to diminish our convictions by understanding our insight so this way wisdom is very very powerful and we do need to do that we need to be able to start thinking assessing uh, uh, considering using critical judgment in order to be able to notice that the way in which we see things is not the way in which things are. And we have to see that with clarity, not just understand it, but understand it with clarity and to be able to recognize it. So I'm not saying, uh, I, I, what I'm saying is, is that this is important to recognize in terms of uh, the six perfections are are less powerful, they're definitely less powerful without wisdom, but they're not meaningless without wisdom. And they're very, very valuable and they do help us develop wisdom. But at the same time, for us to ignore or to reject the need to develop our minds to, to be able to make critical assessment, this would be a mistake. Also, this would be a mistake. If we find it hard to do that, then it's still a good idea for us to think how, you know, to imagine how wonderful it would be to be able to do that and to aspire towards it rather than say, I can't do this. Right? We say, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. This is one of the types of laziness we talked about last week or the week before. So this sort of thing is like saying it's not recognizing the subtle impermanent nature of our minds, the fact that in fact everything's changing and the fact that I find it difficult or challenging right now does not mean I find it difficult or challenging next year or the year after that. If I work at it, if I train, if I develop myself, I'm able to change who I am. I help. It helps. You know, we can do these things. So then also, he says, um, we need to work on um, it, diminishing the causes of confusion. So, for instance, he says that re relying on bad friends, laziness, indolence, taking no pleasure in developing our mind in an analysis or discernment, right? These are things we've just been talking about. A lack of interest in the variety of things, the pride of thinking, I know it when I don't know it. This is the arrogance of the position we often find with younger um, younger adults and sometimes children, it's like, oh yeah, I know all that. And it's like, okay, well, why do you think that? You're not going to learn anything, right? So there's also this uh, thing of sort of, there's an idea which is like, uh, uh, when we first learn something, we think, oh, I understand it all. And yet, actually, we have only just begun to scrape our understanding of something. Or also thinking someone like me cannot do this. Um, and finding it difficult to take pleasure in learning or take pleasure in uh, the learned, um, you know, uh, finding opportunities to learn, um, uh, avoiding that. So again, uh, studying and learning with, in accordance with our capacity, not to try and do more than we can do because we end up feeling very disconsolate and very... Uh, uh, unable to do it, and um, that can lead us to 
uh, feel uh, um, despondent in terms of our ability not to take an easy ride and find somebody who will actually bore us or or um, we will always feel like um, come on come on I want to hear the I want to hear what comes next uh, which can all also lead to bad habits in its own right which is going to need we need to be able to have somebody who we can tune into who can tune it to our needs So again, it's one thing to find somebody who can teach, uh, and uh, it's one thing, and another thing to be able to learn. And then again, it's also to be able to listen to what somebody says, and then to take it away, to think about it, to work on it, to turn it into something that is actually useful to us, right? So we can go. We might be the ideal model student with our pencils lined up and take perfect notes. But if it doesn't actually, if we don't think about it, we don't actually use it. We don't put it into some sort of context of our lives. Start and trying to bring it to a position where it informs us, then it's not so useful for us. It just becomes something that we attended or that we learned once. So the idea is to make it, is to bring life to it, to breathe life into it through uh, turning it into something that we recognize or, or can relate to. Asura, Aryasura, who's one of the students of uh, Nagarjuna, uh, early uh, teacher um, of, um, of uh, the wisdom uh, traditions, um, said that um, if we don't study properly uh, in terms of the path, and he's talking about here in terms of the path, both in terms of meditation and insight, he says, we, we won't, you won't know how to meditate properly. And he says, um, and if you haven't studied, what will there to be reflect upon? What will there be to, to reflect upon? You won't even know what it is that you're meant to be working on. So from having made an effort, if the cause is, our, the cause is for us to have made an effort in study, then the benefit is that we now know how to meditate, and likewise we know what it is that we're meditating on. And Maitreya says in Sublime Continuum, the Uttara Tantra, he says, um, um, all of the all the afflictions. And we're going to do this in brief uh, a paraphrase. All of the in, in afflictions there are, such as stinginess and all the other obscurations, only um, wisdom can eliminate them. Everything, some things can diminish them. We can certainly work on attacking them, but uh, it is wisdom alone that actually eliminates them completely. And study is the basis of wisdom. So this is so he says. Therefore, um, because wisdom is supreme as our conqueror for our conqueror of our uh, afflictions, and because study is the basis of, uh, if you like, is the cause of wisdom, then study is supreme. Is what he's saying here. Shanti Davis says, again, um, be forbearing and study. So take the time out to study to learn, then stay in a forest, and then work at your meditation. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of this is saying you know, the importance about being able to give ourselves the opportunity to uh, free ourselves from a reluctance to study um, and also uh, develop a sense of enthusiasm and joy for loving learning. This love of learning is a very, very powerful way of us overcoming our, our trepidation and very, very useful for us in many ways. And although in many ways this is, these are written for children or for, for, for the young, it's also true, regardless of how old that we are, that to think about saying, when we have an opportunity to develop ourselves, especially within the path, then it's a good idea for us to follow it through. When we feel, in a sense, that we know it, that we understand it all, then maybe um, we need to look deeper uh, and understand a bit more deeply of what's, uh, what, what it means. So even if um, we attend a, a beginner's um, meditation group or whatever, 
and we feel okay well this is nothing new but there's still plenty to learn and likewise um, there's also an opportunity to demonstrate how to um, to 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 help so you can assist the teacher um, uh, in terms of providing guide um, by demonstrating example behavior right example behavior but also by listening carefully or showing to listening carefully and considering how best you know what 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 uh, how the teacher is being able to manage or or not the group and so we can learn from that as well so even when we're experts then it's always a good idea to think about okay well how does this work Okay, so I think um, there's a lot more. Uh, uh, Jay Rinpoche doesn't really um, finish this. He goes on to continue to praise uh, wisdom for another three or four pages. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll leave that till next week now. Um, but in brief, what we've covered is some of the, the um, additional areas of, of wisdom in terms of study, in terms of insight, in terms of understanding, um, and also in terms of the training and mastery of, of various different skills um, and how beneficial they are to us in our path if we do them with these within the scope of the sublime of recognizing this with the motive of working towards all beings um, with the motive of achieving enlightenment um, in, in, with the motive of being good at what we do yeah so even though uh, this in general is talked about these these um five uh, sort of qualities such as science and, and and so on these these other areas of learning most of the effort is going to be on understanding the nature of reality it comes down to the four noble truths and also in a sense the truth of suffering so the the actual true nature of suffering and how that works is very much what um, uh, and how suffering depends upon this uh, self um, self-grasping grasping at the self-existence so this particular thing here is, um, this is most of the work that we're going to be doing or that we do as, as uh, in terms of meditation practice. But Jeremy Shea is also covering the idea of saying that, you know, learning medicine, learning the arts, uh, learning mathematics, learning um, um, uh, these other things, science and so on, uh, and language are very, very useful for us if we use them with the motivation uh, set out as a part of our path yeah so within that we have to think well that doesn't co cover all things because it, uh, doing punting or something like that which is a cause of suffering or violence is certainly excluded from that list so it's not like you can do anything you like but certainly to do what you can uh, is like for instance develop the craftsmanship um, there's nothing wrong with that in fact there's many benefits to that and so in, in many ways it's saying although the path can be slower to be a master weaver there's nothing or or, or any other um, uh, artisan or developing an artisanal skill or to be an author or whatever it can be quite an obstacle in terms of some of our aspects of practice um, but it is possible to use that uh, in our practice and to be informed by it in our practice so whatever choices we make to think about how we can use that within our practice is very very good anyway so um, next week I'll just finish off a little bit on the wisdom chapter and then we're going to do a final chapter on how to gather disciples I think is the last um, is how to help others basically so yeah it's called how to help others and then that will be the end I think we might have two weeks on that and then that will be the end of volume two and we'll be moving on to volume three um, so until then let's uh, dedicate any better bits so the idea of dedication is to say yeah look I want to use this what I've learned um, and, and what I've taught uh, in order to benefit um, my mind to help inform me such that I can continue to develop my aspiration uh, 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 as a bodhisattva or to become a bodhisattva um, in order to be able to benefit all beings I think that's good okay so let's now uh, just uh, 
because I've finished off with a little bit of meditation 